Okay, thanks, Andy, and good morning to everyone. Uh, Randy and I have given versions of this presentation several times, both together and separately, but uh, this, this one is going to be a little bit different. Uh, you you have may, may have seen previous versions of it, but following the release of the NTSB report in May, this is really our first opportunity to include that kind of information and actually address what, what we call the elephant in the room which is how weather information was used by the company and what role did it play in the accident. Now, we didn't have access to various parties involved in the accident, like the captain, due to the litigation concerns. So this is our, our chance to complete the picture, so to speak. Uh, we might go a little long. There's a lot to present. There's, there's no way we can cover it all. So I'll, I'll urge you to, to take some time and read the service assessment and the NTSB report. And if you're so inclined, take a look at the NTSB online docket for some light summer reading. It only contains 4,000 pages of documents and interviews. Um, so that will keep you occupied for a while. Um, and at this point, I think we'll just turn it over to Randy and he'll get started. Uh, he'll do the first half of the presentation and I'll finish it up. So take it away, Randy. Great. Thanks, Dick. Um, so we'll kind of... The first part of it will be a little bit of kind of just refresher in the environment um, in which the derecho occurred, and then we'll talk about the storm morphology. And, and, the, and as Dick was saying, we really have a lot of information now on the user actions and what they knew, when they knew it, and we'll kind of uh, correlate it to as the derecho is evolving, what the actions or inaction was being taken um, by the duck boat and the, and the company that owned them. Then we'll talk about some of the unique aspects of the event and, and what that implies for messaging for vulnerable user groups. And then, and then Dick will really wrap it all together with the service assessment findings and, and recommendations. And then a little bit more about, about what they knew um, as well and what the kind of information they were looking at. So this is a, a refresher. This was a derecho event, as Andy said, that occurred on uh, July 19, 2018. That resulted in the sinking of Stretch Duck 7, uh, 17 of the 29 individuals on board perished. Sadly, um, you can see the swath of damage here with the W's being wind reports, the H's being hail reports. Um, it started as elevated convection in north central Kansas in the morning, uh, quickly became surface based as it moves towards Topeka and then evolved into um, a QLCS and derecho as it moved into west central Kansas or east central Kansas. Um, there was over 115 reports of wind damage. Um, for uh, measurements of severe winds over a, a wide swath that you can see there. And the white circle down there is where Table Rock Lake is um, in the lower center part of the image. And so basically the, the environment, just real briefly, we won't go into it too much because we really want to get more into the, the user actions and, and how, how the day evolved. But there was an upper level trough centered over the Western Great Lakes. It was moving very slowly east. Um, you can see there's northwest flow. It was really deep northwest flow and it was increasing over uh, Eastern Kansas and Missouri through the afternoon. Um, in the morning, here's a 12Z surface map um, that shows a, a cold front that's moving through um, central Nebraska and a warm front draped across western Iowa into northern Missouri. And as you went through the morning, that cold front sagged south. This is now 0Z. You can see the cold fronts moved down into to Kansas and, and far northwest Missouri. And storms were forming out, just out ahead of that cold front in the, in the morning. And you can see at this point that Missouri, Southern Missouri, where Table Rock Lake is, is really deeply embedded in the warm sector um, ahead of that cold front. So here's kind of the SPC evolution from that day. And it really wasn't expected to be a big day initially, um, the day before or even the morning of the event. Um, this is the 12Z outlook from SPC and Table Rock Lake's really kind of right on the border between the uh, general thunder and the marginal risk area. But at 11 or at about 10 a.m., they issued this uh, MCD. Um, they really saw that the threat really ramping up that morning and that this was going to be a, an area to be concerned about. And they talked about a mixture of supercells and Boeing clusters being possible. And then at 11.20, they issued a severe thunderstorm watch, uh, mentioning corridors of damaging winds and large hail uh, can be expected. And this was over seven hours uh, before the event at Table Rock Lake, which may it's an interesting thing to, to consider that the, the watch warning gap was extremely long in this case for Table Rock Lake where the, the, the watch came out far, far before the, the threat got to that area. 
at this time, 11.29 a.m., that private weather vendor, uh, Ride the Ducks Branson, or RDTB, which you'll see through many of the slides, they were notified of the watch um, via um, uh, email, and the dispatch and captains of the duck boats were aware of, that the watch, uh, severe thunderstorm watch, was in effect. So this is seven to 500 millibar lapse rates. And one thing I just wanted to point out here is they really steepen through the afternoon. You can see a maxima of 7.5 degrees Celsius per kilometer there at the Southwest Missouri. There was a minima, uh, the 6.5 area that was persistent through the day. That wasn't a result of convection moving through the area. That was there um, throughout the day. Um, this is a 22Z. So the environment was supportive of strong updrafts across the Missouri. Um, and as the storms went through that 6.5 degree lapse rate area, they did kind of um, diminish a little bit. It didn't, obviously didn't weaken it strongly, but they did kind of look a little a little less intense briefly when they went through there. And then they moved into that really steep lapse rate area in southwest Missouri. And we'll see uh, here in a bit how they really exploded when they went into there, into that region. So this is kind of the, the, the SBK and SIN and the, and the radar data. And what I really want to show here is that it, it rode along the, the, the Cape uh, Sin gradient. Um, so you can see on the southern end that there's really a ton of Cape, um, very unstable air mass into far um, southern Missouri. And it kind of rode along the axis where there was a Cape minima um, in central Missouri following um, some supercell storms that developed earlier in the day and some cold outflow air that we'll see here in a bit when we look at the radar data. And the storms kind of rode down that axis and then turned or the derecho then really turned kind of south southeast as it got into southern Missouri and just dived into that really unstable and uncapped air mass. So we're gonna take a look at a radar loop here and I'll let this run several times because there's a lot to look at. But you'll see there's a supercell in central Missouri that's laying out this big outflow boundary as it crosses I-44 uh, as it goes through Springfield and the derecho is moving into um, west central Missouri and, and you can see kind of how it organizes itself. You can see the outflow racing out ahead as it becomes kind of cold pool dominant. And then it interacts with this old supercell outflow boundary south of I-44. And you can see how it just explodes and re-intensifies um, uh, significantly as it moves into far southern Missouri. The red dot, of course, is the, the uh, location of the incident. Now, a couple of things to note here is you'll see a lot of cell mergers that go on as, as the derecho is moving into uh, west central Missouri. And then you'll see kind of a period where it starts to look a little disorganized um, as it moves into this colder, this, this outflow air that's left behind by the supercell. Um, and at this point, you can kind of see it's starting to look a little less organized. It's becoming very cold pool dominant. And then it interacts with the old boundary and really intensifies as it moves into that really unstable air mass that's sitting in southern Missouri in northern Arkansas. So we'll go through some time steps now and just kind of look at f features uh, associated with the derecho and boundaries, et cetera, that are left behind. Um, and then kind of contrast that with what is going on with the duck boat company at the exact time that we're looking at this radar data or as close as we can approximate it. So this is 4.30 p.m. The derecho is moving into west central Missouri. Um, I just have Springfield radar data here, so it's pretty far from the radar still at this point. But you can see the white arrows are pointing to a couple of cell mergers that are about to occur with the derecho and convection that's um, out ahead of it. And then you can see the black arrows are highlighting this uh, outflow that's left behind by the supercell that's diving south towards Springfield. Um, at this point, you know, the, the man, there's a manager on duty at the Branson facility for the Ride the Ducks, and they usually monitor the weather. That's one of their responsibilities. And they generally brief the captains before they leave the facility if weather is noteworthy. Captains, however, have the final say concerning whether it's safe to enter the water. So they kind of have a, a somebody to check up on the weather for them and have a discussion, and then the, and then the captains will make the final decision. Um, they can communicate with the captains when they're on the water via radio, and they're also responsible for other activities during the day, such as closing the cash drawers um, and, and finalizing, you know, the, the day's business, which is important in this case because the Stretch Duck 7 that sank was the last duck of the day to go in the water. So we'll move ahead a, a little over an hour. This is 5.39 uh, p.m. As you can see, a nice tight low-level reflectivity gradient um, with the derecho at this point. But you can also note via the white arrows there that the 
uh, outflow is starting to get out ahead of the um, updraft interface. Red notch is indicative of a nice rear inflow notch, uh, very prominent. Um, and so this is moving very fast at this time, 50 to 55 miles per hour. And you'll see that the uh, black arrows are pointing to the old outflow there from the earlier supercell that is now just kind of draped south of the interstate. So we'll move ahead a little, another 30 minutes or so. Um, again, you can see the white arrows showing the outflow now for, surging further out ahead um, of the updraft towers. It's moving 60 miles per hour at this point. Uh, the outflow is moving extremely rapidly. Uh, base velocity showed winds greater than 80 knots at less than 1,000 feet above ground level as it approached Springfield. And now it's starting to move through this that outflow area left by the old um, supercell. And the black arrows, of course, are pointing to the supercell outflow boundary that's stalled out there south of the interstate. And so there starts to become, what I would say, it just starts to look a little bit less organized here for a brief period of time as it's moving through this air mass. Now, between 5.45 and 6 p.m., uh, the Ride Ducks, the general manager, looked at radar data and directed another employee to monitor the weather as he took a boat out for its tour. It's one of the last uh, few boats of the day to go out. So what they did was they indicated that they used a hand, their hand to assess the distance and timing of the storm. So they're looking at um, to timing and trying to figure out when it's going to get to the to, um, Table Rock Lake. And they're basically using their hand to, uh, to assess how long it's going to take based on the motion of the system. And of course, they're probably not very aware, and Dick will talk about this later, of this outflow boundary as opposed to the uh, yellows and reds that are drawing attention to uh, your eye. Now, 6.33, this is what I was talking about, how it becomes, starts to look a little less organized with time. It becomes kind of more of a broken-looking linear feature. Um, you really see it's very, it's still very se severe. You can see all the severe wind reports in the Springfield area there. Um, but it's becoming a less, little less organized. When you look at the data, really close the radar data really closely, you see initiation of updrafts occurring on the outflow, drifting back over the cold pool and repeatedly collapsing, reinforcing the uh, cold pool as it moves south. So it's still quite severe, but it doesn't have that tight low level reflectivity gradient. It doesn't look very organized as far as rear inflow notches, et cetera, at this point, but it's still this massive wind producer at this point. Um, and and, and if, it, if we didn't move into this air mass and interact with this boundary further south, it would be, it would, it's kind of interesting to, to wonder what might have happened with the system, but it's moving into an extremely favorable air mass in the next um, uh, 20, 30 minutes. Notably, the office issued a severe thunderstorm warning uh, for Table Rock Lake area. You can see the red dot in, in, indicating where the incident occurred in the, at 632. So 28 minutes of lead time before the accident, you know, a, a really a good warning that was out well in advance of uh, the impact at Table Rock Lake. So there's a lot going on at this time as far as the, as the captains and the Ride the Ducks uh, company. So at 627, uh, Stretch Duck 7 captain and manager on duty view radar data at the Duck Dock in Branson. They have an office there right by the boat launch and they're looking at the radar data. At 628, the manager on duty tells the captain to do the water portion first to beat the weather. They know, they know they're in a severe thunderstorm watch. Um, they can see this uh, um, derecho coming towards them. They obviously they don't really have a, a good understanding of how, how violent it really is. Usually they do the drive portion through town first and then the water part in the in the lake second. Looking at this system coming in, they decided let's do the water portion first to try to beat the weather. Um, at 632 and that warning comes out, it specifically mentions table rock. Um, it mentions movement of 50 miles per hour and gusts to 60 miles per hour. At that same minute, the private weather vendor is hired by the company, sends them an email regarding the severe thunderstorm warning. The manager on duty, it does not appear, was aware um, and did not have uh, access to that email, did not see that email. Finally, at 6.33, Stretch Duck 7 departs the facility for the lake and they do not have knowledge of the severe thunderstorm warning. Um, even though they are aware of the, the weather, it's kind of headed their way from radar and they know that they're in a severe thunderstorm watch, they did not see the, the warning when they went in the water or when they left the facility. Now at 646, um, you can really see this thing start to re-intensify as it interacts with that old outflow boundary. 
and you can really see on the southwest flank how much more intense it's starting to look. Um, and it's, this is one that's moving into that extremely unstable air mass in far southern Missouri. It's uncapped and, there, you know, there's no sand and it's like 4,000 joules of cape at this time in the afternoon. And you can really, really see how it intensifies here in the next couple images. So at 648, just a couple minutes after this radar image, the private vendor sends an email to ride the ducks uh, regarding the lightning alert, saying that there's lightning within, uh, you know, within 20 or 30 miles of the, of the, uh, of their their location. 60, 650 p.m. The captain conducts a safety safety briefing for those that are on the boat. Notes that the side windows are the emergency exits, and that they they will you know if they need to exit the 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 boat, your side exit is out the the egress is out the sides of the boat, out the windows, because um, they're just like flaps. Um, and he tells passengers that they will be informed if they need. To, uh, life jackets and he mentions in this briefing that they will get probably get a little wet um, because there's some weather coming in finally 701 p.m you can see the outflow now is surging through um, the location where the incident occurred um, they went in the water at 655 um, and this is where the, you can see how the derecho really rapidly intensifies again as it moves in that very unstable air mass you can see rear inflow notches and has uh, really quickly redeveloped and is a really strong Boeing segment. It's, and you can see this rear inflow notch here that's kind of head pointed right towards uh, Table Rock Lake. And you also note that the outflow at this point is surged well ahead of it. It's five to 10 nautical miles ahead of it across most of the, of the line. And the, the high winds and it depending on your locations preceded the precipitation by as much as 10 to 15 minutes um, because the outflow was so far ahead of the, the deep convective towers. So between 6.38 and 7 p.m., uh, managers performing daily sales closeouts, because I didn't mention Stretch Duck 7 was the last duck boat of the day. And so this is on a different floor from where the weather displays are. So they, they go to a different floor to close out the cash registers, et cetera, for the day away from the weather monitors. Um, between 6.50 and 7 p.m., previous duck tours exit the water. There was two other ones out ahead of the two that got caught in the uh, derecho uh, winds and they were exiting. Captain of one of the duck boats that was exiting the water commented on seeing approaching lightning over the hills in the distance. And then at 655, stretch duck seven enters the water. Five minutes later, the duck is overtaken by a gust front. Um, there was two ducks in the in the water at that time. Um, the captain of the one that sank decides to shorten the tour and lowers the side curtains in a form's passage that they attempted to beat the storm. Um, let them know that we were trying to beat the storm, lowered the side curtains to keep them from getting wet, or as wet, maybe. Um, now, if this is 706, you can see the outflow is clearly, um, it's now moving into the Arkansas, Missouri border area. Um, it's the south of the site. The area of more intense convection is approaching the accident site at this point and the boat section continues to surge forward. You start to see a break in the line indicative of very strong winds approaching that location. So at 701, the captain lowered the side curtains to keep the passengers drier. Um, one thing that the Coast Guard and NTSB noted, especially the NTSB report noted, was that this increases the sail area on the boat and makes the vesicle, vessel more difficult to maneuver. I think these are uh, not very easy uh, vessels to maneuver anyway, but lowering the side curtains makes them uh, more difficult to maneuver. It's 702. The private vendor sent an email to Ride the Ducks noting the issuance of an SVS to the midpoint essentially of the statement and it mentions 70 mile per hour winds. Then at 704, uh, just four minutes after it being overcome by the outflow, the bilge alarm goes off for the first time and the captain attempts four calls to the facility between 703 and 705 with no response. And that's because the manager on duty at the facility is on a different floor from where the radio is and where the, uh, the weather uh, displays are. Finally, at 7.07, the bilge alarm goes off a second time. And so the bilge is trying to pump water out of the bottom of the duck boat um, at, a, at a rapid manner. Um, and it's going off saying that it's being activated because water is coming into the, into the boat. Finally, at 7.10, you can see that the heavy convective towers are now reaching the duck boat site um, where the accident occurred. 
some precipitation is now starting at this point where, where um, they've already been in very, very high winds for 10 minutes and the boat segment, segment continues to surge forward. So between 7.05 and 7.08, the captain does not communicate with the passengers except to tell them to move to the port side. That's the left side if you're facing the front of the boat, to move them to the port side of the boat because um, the other side was sagging. Um, at 7.08 p.m., the port side curtain is released, which means you drop the, the plastic curtain that just falls off the boat. Um, and it makes it so that there's an open uh, egress so you can exit the boat if you have to. Um, the starboard uh, starboard curtain is not dropped at that point. Um, moments after that drop of the curtain was released, uh, it stretched up seven sinks and 17 of the 29 perished. In reading their accounts of the survivors is, is quite frankly horrifying um, about their desperate attempts to get out of this boat. Um, and a number of them got out because the top of the boat peeled off a little bit and they were uh, able to escape out the top of the boat. Some, of course, escaped out the port side curtains that were the windows that were dropped, but a curtain was dropped, but others escaped through the top, which was peeled back. Um, at the 7.08 p.m. time as the stretch dunk is going underwater, the first call to Stone County Sheriff Department was received. Uh, there's a larger vessel, uh, kind of a dinner vessel uh, called the Branson Bell. It was there, um, not very far at all from where this accident occurred, and they were people on there watching, and the Branson Bell had stayed docked um, because of the weather. And so they recorded at the Branson Bell at 710, uh, wind speed of 73 miles per hour on their uh, wind sensor on the top of their boat. And that's when the light rain began occurring was at 710. So some interesting aspects of this, and if you've seen this presentation, uh, let's talk about this before, you've seen this slide. Um, the lightning was an interesting component in the sense that the nearest lightning flashes over the previous 30 minutes had been a cloud to ground strike 30, 13 miles away and an in-cloud flash, flash about 11 miles away. And that's in the 30 minutes leading up. So here the purple flashes are in-cloud and the orange flashes are, um, or the orange are the cloud to ground lightning. So they didn't really maybe have much audible cue um, that you would normally get with severe weather approaching because they really probably didn't hear much thunder, if any at all, as the thing got close. And, and, and you know, because the outflow was so far out ahead of the deep convective towers, they didn't get much audible cue, although the one duck boat captain did mention that they saw lightning in the distance as they were exiting the water. A couple other things that um, stand out about this event were the, the duration of the severe gusts was very long. So in the upper right, you see um, there was two outflows that went through Springfield, Missouri. This is um, observations from the Springfield uh, WFO or ASOS. And what you'll see is the green is the first outflow that went through with the supercell and the, the blue is the temperature trace and red is the dew point trace. And you see a little temperature drop there. And then the red shaded area is when the derecho came through and you can see the really extreme temperature drop that occurred with that. If you look in the lower right, what we have there is green is the wind speed and uh, maroon is the wind gust. And what you'll note is that the wind gusts, and on the y-axis there you can see wind speed in knots, there was numerous gusts to 50 knots or greater that extended over about a 35 minute period um, which is extremely long uh, for a derecho like this. Usually you'll, you know, have fury from this kind of system for 10 or 15 minutes or something. But this one was really, really prolonged. There was, there was extreme gusts associated with the outflow and then a second period of really high gusts as the convective towers um, came through. So really, really an unusually long lived event, which of course, if you're um, trying to get out of the water or get to the Branson Bell or to the shore for safety um, is, is an exceptionally long time um, to, to try, have to deal with, with extreme winds and waves. So finally, the wave height estimates. This is just, uh, you can see this is how Table Rock Lake is a really comp complex shoreline. It's just this kind of snake, um, snake looking lake with all these bays and inlets all over the place. And so we did some very basic, um, wind wave calculations and put in the, the red lines kind of in the, the white uh, numbers show you different fetch lengths based on different wind directions to the incident location. So depending on what the exact wind direction was, 
from say between 340 and 010, um, the effects length range from about 1.6 miles to 3.7 miles. Um, putting those wind speeds in that we know occurred, you can get a significant wave height of 2.7 to 3.7 feet, and that's based on 45 to 55 knot winds. If you bump that up to you know the 60 knot winds, you, it just bumps it up a little bit. Not much difference between the different fetch lengths because the fetch lengths aren't very long. Um, another thing is the shoreline complexity that accounted for as far as reflective waves and that sort of thing. But one thing that was really interesting when you put these in was the wave periodicity is 2.7 to 3.6 seconds, which is really short. Um, so the waves are striking the boats at very short intervals. And the intake for the, uh, for the vessel, for the bilge is on the front of the boat. And so water is coming in through that as they're plowing into these waves, which they're hitting at a really high frequency. And that's filling up the bottom of the boat with water. The bilge is trying to pump it out, but it's just coming in too fast uh, for it to be able to handle. So that's kind of the, the evolution of what was being done at the facility and by the captains through uh, the event and kind of correlating with the evolution of the radar data. And at this point, I will turn it over to uh, Dick to take it the rest of the way. Okay, thanks Randy. Um, at this point, uh, we'll switch our focus to potential messaging and, and kind of look at this a little bit from the uh, the view of, of Ride to Ducks Branson. And if you can step ahead there, Randy, uh, next to the next slide there. I apologize in advance for repeating some of what Randy just talked about, but I hope this will provide some context into the decision making that was going on and to be Blunt to the point, we'll see that misinterpretation and miscommunication at uh, Ride the Ducks played a, a crucial role in, in the accident. Uh, we'll use the image here on the right to uh, describe in a little more detail what the captain and dispatch manager uh, on duty were looking at prior to leaving the so-called duck dock, that's what they call it in Branson, and, and heading toward the water. Um, Ride the Ducks. Uh, subscribes to uh, Earth Network's uh, weather services, which provides them with radar data, one minute lightning data, 15 minute lightning data, surface wind alerts, and uh, NWS weather warnings. And they're, as most of you know, their delivery platform is a streamer RT. Now the, the Earth Network's method for radar mosaics consists of a subscription to weather decision technologies and that's where a, a two-step process occurs uh, for, uh, for smoothing. Uh, weather decision tech mosaics the level two data and smooths for non-precipitation targets. And that process only takes about a minute or so before it's time stamped with the data acquisition time of the ADD. And in this case, that's 2320Z, which you can see in the lower right-hand corner of that image. And this image is from, uh, not from Earth Networks, it's from Weather Decision Technologies. So, and this is the image they send to Earth Networks, and Earth Networks in turn smooths it again. And they only publish on the fives, and then they re timestamp their image with the publication time, not the actual time of the data. So, in this case, that's about 2325Z. So, not only is there a, a five minute lag from the actual time of the data to when it is published, it is misleadingly timestamped five minutes after the fact. And uh, the dashed line that you see there is where the actual location of the gust front was at, at 2325Z, uh, well in advance of the re, uh, reflectivity cores. So to kind of rehash what Randy talked about a little bit, at, at 6.27 p.m., both the manager on duty and the captain self-briefed at the duck dock in Branson using the data off this image, which is, which is misleading. They, they eyeballed the storm location of movement, thought they had much more time than they did to, to make the water portion of the trip and, and made a decision to go. And so in summary, you know, despite having access to a weather vendor, their, their risk assessment was poor and that they did not understand that severe weather was much closer than implied by the radar. And they were not aware that there was a gust, strong gust front uh, five to 10 miles ahead of the main reflectivity course. That's, that's a, a typo there in the, uh, in the slide, it's five to 10 miles. Uh, and then from interviews with the general manager and the captain, uh, they were mostly concerned with the red yellow images, and it's just a, a matter of procedure for them. Um, so they're looking at the colors on the, the radar display and they not only mistimed the event, but they underestimated the severity as well. 
Okay, next slide, Randy. So as they're preparing to leave the uh, the duck dock, the severe thunderstorm warning comes out, as Randy mentioned, and Earth Network sends the warning to ride the ducks via email. And apparently the, the manager on duty is not aware of this. And and stretch duck seven head to the water at 6.33 p.m. without knowledge of, uh, of the warning. And over the next half hour or so, there's email updates to the warnings, like lightning proximity alerts from Earth Networks. None of that is communicated to the boats uh, with radio or, or phone contact. And, um, and as Randy mentioned, this was a time where these were the last uh, boat tours of the day and when the manager on duty performs you know, business closeout activities. So uh, here's a point where I'll, I'll suggest a, a potential takeaway for those of us that, that provide DSS to our own partners. And that here's a, a case where uh, a simple phone call can go a long way when dealing with someone who may be distracted by other duties. And uh, so it's kind of important to note, you know, to, don't always assume someone is waiting breathlessly for the next text product to come out, especially at a critical moment. So stretch deck seven, when it gets to the water, is pretty much left at, at this point to make a decision. You know, the captain is, is going to make a decision based on what he sees. When, and this is the picture right here as they're entering the water. Um, and you can see that uh, it's pretty calm. Uh, the captain knows there's storms to the north. Uh, and can see the buildups like like you and I can in the distance there. Uh, but he still thinks he has plenty of time and that the winds will be less than 35 knots, uh, which is what the, the duck boats are actually rated for. So he goes in and at this point, you can see that the, this is the NTSB graphic at the bottom here. Uh, there's four boats in the water during the morning, all uh, during the morning, all at once. And uh, five minutes from this, when this picture was taken, two, but two boats will be out of the water and the other two will get hard by these 70 mile an hour winds and four foot high short period of waves. And in eight more minutes, the third boat will be ashore, but stretch deck seven gets swamped with 29 people on board and more than half won't survive it. That's 13 minutes from the, the time this picture was taken. Okay, Randy, next slide. So in a lot of times, in tragedies like this, there's a certain degree of bad luck involved, like just being in the wrong place at the wrong time. I and mean, we see it all the time. Uh, I think that's true in this case as well. Uh, the fact that a timely and, and accurate severe thunderstorm warning somehow didn't get in the hands of decision makers was, was pretty unfortunate. Um, but you know, if it had, what kind of things could we have done or, or what other kind of things that, that, that could have been done to, to have helped keep the uh, uh, the boats off the water. Uh, would it help to better communicate the more unique attributes of the of the situation? And in this case, for example, the damaging winds were well ahead of precipitation and perhaps even uh, the thunder. Uh, should we communicate that typical typical cues may be inadequate? And uh, and how about unusually fast storm motion and communicating that um, that you may have less time than typical to take cover or even communicating time of arrival windows when you're confident in the storm propagation. Okay, next slide. Now, as Randy mentioned, the uh, uh, duration of the winds were unusually long in this case, which could be useful information for boaters and campers, uh, perhaps using something descriptive along the lines of these storms produced damaging winds for an unusually extended duration. In Springfield, winds of 50 to 60 miles an hour occurred over a 30 minute period. Uh, which is amazing, by the way, that the, the duration uh, of those types of winds. Um, another area of low-hanging fruit, I think, is, is filling the longer periods between the watch and the warning with timing and severity information. And here, info from mesoanalysis could fill this void. Communicating increasing or decreasing risk through the day could fill the void. Or even um, you know, could the use of worn on forecast information fill those gaps. Uh, these, these are all important considerations because vulnerable outdoor populations desire information um, concerning the extra time needed to take shelter, whether it be in the context of the warning or the pre-warning period. It just you really can't easily shelter people in vulnerable locations in just a few minutes. So it, it requires some thinking ahead on our part whenever we can. Uh, I know earlier in the science series, I think back in early April, uh, Dan Hoblitzel from the Nashville office made what I thought was an excellent presentation on the importance of telling people what to do 
to persuade them to take sheltering action. And uh, this concept is especially useful for those that require extra planning and extra time. Okay. Next slide. All right, so last I, I want to talk about, talk on a couple slides from the service assessment. While NTSB and the Coast Guard were, were tasked with finding things like probable cause, we had to shift the gears away from that for legal reasons and because we were restricted in who we could interview. Uh, so our emphasis became focused on risk assessment and communication and how vulnerable outdoor populations receive and react to weather information. And we did over three dozen interviews in that regard, plus interviews of more traditional partners like, uh, like emergency managers and the local media. So next slide. So the first area we wanted to cover was path cast and locations impacted options in Warren Gen. And you can see here a best practice that every office should follow is the inclusion of, of key points for outdoor locations like state parks, marinas, Beaches, you know, all those things need to be in your orange and location file so they'll show up in your mornings. Uh, I think I'm pretty sure most offices do that at this point. Um, you can click ahead here, Randy. There we go. So you can see in this example, this is the uh, this is the example that Springfield used on the Table Rock Parade warning. Uh, uh, it's the uh, uh, the locations impacted list. Uh, some users noted that. Some of these locations in these long lists like this are hard to find and ask that they be listed in chronological order according to or or starting with, I guess, which location would be impacted first. Um, click ahead, Randy. So the vast majority of the users that we interviewed preferred the time of arrival option. And I have to say at this point that most people we interviewed were more savvy than we sometimes give them credit for. Uh, for example, in our interviews, they almost universally understood the difference between a watch and a warning. So in a lot of ways, I think that's kind of a myth when we say that they don't understand the distinction. Uh, they also largely understood that times of arrival could have some slop in them, and, and they expected there would be a window of arrival plus and minus, say, five or ten minutes around the time listed. So perhaps using arrival windows is something that we, need, we can work toward in the future if that would be useful. And this is why we're encouraging greater consideration for the past cast than, than historically we've done so. Uh, when you are reasonably confident in propagation, which, which isn't always the case, of course. Uh, we also need to make a point here about the path cast. Uh, and you can see on the previous, the previous uh, image there, um, we had a, a, a mock-up that we did, and right away you can see, if you can step back there, Randy, so we can see that. Yeah, you can see that path cast right there on that mock-up. Um, there's a problem with it. There's only three locations listed, and that's because the polyline used has two endpoints and no intermediate vertices. And this is a warm gen flaw for polylines. It only sweeps out path cast locations downstream for vertices and endpoints. And in this case, you can see the key areas like Table Rock State Park uh, and Branson are missed because there's no vertex in the middle of the line. So now you can click ahead, Randy. There we go. So this is another mock-up here. This one actually has uh, three uh, vertices, two endpoints and one vertex in the middle. Um, and this is what you need to make this work properly. Um, we, you, you can see it's, we're going to be a little fast here because we're not right on top of the gust front, but step ahead one more, Randy, and we'll see the output. There we go. So this is what it should look like. And you can see here the output shows the arrival time at the accident site is 6.55 p.m., which is pretty darn close. You know, we'll never know if the warning, if it got into stretch spec seven, um, would have kept the boat off the water, nor do we know for sure if a time of arrival would have made a difference. But I... I'd like to think so in either case. In short, you know, users like the time of arrival estimate because it's key information and nobody likes to work in a vacuum when it comes to decision making. And, and many key partners will work up their own time of arrival estimates rather than sit in a vacuum like we, we saw here with the, uh, uh, the duck boat uh, manager on duty and the captain. And that's especially true if they have you know, the safety of, consider, uh, of constituents to consider. 
Okay, let's click one more here. And this is where, this is how NTSB weighed in on that topic. And the emphasis is mine. I'll just go ahead and read this. Uh, the duck did not have a go, no go policy to determine whether to leave the duck dock or enter the water in the advent or forecasting of adverse weather conditions. If such a policy existed that factored in the timing of approaching severe weather based on severe weather watches and warnings and the risk to the safe operations of the waterborne portion of the tour, the manager on duty would have been relieved from having to make a subjective decision to continue with the tours. Okay, and with that, we'll move ahead. There we go. So finally, um, we found that obviously vulnerable outdoor populations increasingly rely on smartphones for real-time updates. And I think we all know by now that method of getting weather information is among these populations particularly is, is here to stay. Uh, and based on that, we made a recommendation to continue to pursue, we, uh, pursue WIAs for high and severes, and the team suggested an 80 mile per hour threshold, and I, I believe that's that's going to happen. Um, and then last, uh, we found that most traditional or non-traditional partners, rather, had limited knowledge or interest in SVSs, and this is something we've also known for a while. Uh, while there, those products are actively disseminated, they're also passively received, and there's no real alerting protocol for updates via the SVS. So we recommend uh, updating SVRs with SVRs and phasing out the SVS. And the advantages for this are pretty straightforward. Uh, you can simplify the, uh, the product stream within the event tracking number for a particular warning, uh, provide a more robust alerting protocol. You can provide increased visibility for follow-ups and uh, there's full EAS alerting capability when you upgrade the attitude of the warning. To escalate the threat. Okay, and the last slide. Yeah, these are this is a simple tack, uh, takeaway, and this is clearly a, a tragic example of interaction between significant weather, a vulnerable user group, and human decision making. And uh, we talked about opportunities to better convey threat to vulnerable users, uh, taking advantage of that watch morning gap uh, to communicate uh, additional information. Uh, sometimes a phone call makes a critical difference for a distracted partner. And then uh, pathcast vertices, consideration for outdoor venues, locations, and warning can all be used for uh, uh, possibly improving uh, messaging. And so that's all I've got. Um,